Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Adam Bullmeyer, and I'm the Education Coordinator and the Fertility Clinic Liaison for the Embryo Adoption Awareness Center. Today, we are very pleased to bring you a special webinar titled, Getting Personal, Families Share Their Embryo Adoption Journeys. Joining us today are two families who have gone through the embryo adoption process firsthand and who have graciously agreed to share their journeys with us this morning. First, you will hear from Laura, who along with her husband, Brad, have had two children from embryo adoption. Next, you will hear from Luke and Joni, who had three children naturally and then turned to embryo adoption to have three more. But before we can begin our presentation, we do need to take care of a little bit of housekeeping. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation using the questions you submit through the Q&A feature. You may submit your questions at any time during the session, and we will answer as many as possible at the end of the presentation. Now, to ask a question, you simply need to click on the Q&A panel in the lower right-hand portion of the screen. Then type your question into the dialog box and click the Send button. If you happen to be in a full screen view, you can click on the question mark icon in the toolbar in the lower right hand corner of the screen, and this will open up the Q&A panel on your screen only. When you submit your question, it will be visible to all the panelists, but not visible to the other attendees. We expect our presentation this morning to last about 45 minutes, and then we'll take the final 15 minutes for the Q&A session. And as a reminder, we will be distributing a copy of today's presentation as well as a comprehensive list of answers to all the questions submitted today during the webinar. And as one final reminder, we are recording this presentation. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties this morning, we would encourage you to contact WebEx Technical Support, and you'll see that number there at the bottom of the screen. It's 866-229-3239. And with that, I believe we are ready to turn it over to Laura. Thank you so much for being here today, and, and we look forward to hearing your story. Thanks for having me today, Adam. Um, as Adam indicated, I'm going to be sharing with you guys today our story of infertility and how God led us to embryo adoption. Um, I'd love to hear any questions you guys might have, and hopefully I can give some of you out there that are struggling with, struggling with infertility some hope. Next slide. My husband and Brad and I met right out of college. We started dating in 2001 and we were married in May of 2003. I had always known that I wanted a family and I was really excited to start uh, as soon as Brad was ready. He wasn't quite as anxious and so we waited a few years. Next slide. We had a big trip planned to Hawaii to watch the Wisconsin Badgers play in the fall of 2005 and we had decided that it was time to start trying soon after that. We had kind of figured this was going to be our last big vacation before kids. Next slide. Well, the trip came and went, and after months and months of trying and nothing happening, I scheduled a visit with my OB. Uh, she indicated it was a little too early to start doing any sort of interventions, but she did agree to run a quick workup of tests on me. Um, everything came back normal, and so we really just kept trying and kept waiting. Um, in the next year, we moved on to do more treatments. Uh, she put me on Clomid, which honestly just made me a little crazy. Um, we did some IUIs and then ran some more tests. We did a workup on Brad, a hysteral cell fingergram on me, and still we had no answers and no pregnancies. Uh, by the fall of 2007, we decided that we really just needed a break. My emotions were getting the best of me, and the roller coaster of infertility was really taking its toll. Uh, we planned another trip to Hawaii to just get away from it all. Next slide. Now, while, while we were in Hawaii, we had started talking more and more about the what's next. We knew that we had exhausted all our options with our OB and that it was time to schedule an appointment with more of the big dogs of infertility, the reproductive endocrinologist. We knew that we would end up spending a small fortune once we opened that door since insurance didn't cover anything, so we decided to meet with three different doctors in the Milwaukee area to decide what their approach would be and then compare the three. Um, Brad and I had talked a lot about what we were and weren't willing to do to build our family, and we had really been praying to God and asking for wisdom in our next steps. Now, while we were in Hawaii, we went to a little beach called McKenna Beach. And while we were there, I remember telling Brad that I absolutely loved the name and that if we were lucky enough to have a girl someday, that I would want to name her McKenna. Um, and he agreed. I later went to look up what McKenna meant, and it meant the gift of happiness. 
Uh, we left feeling energized. We had a new game plan. We had a name picked out if we ever had a girl. And we agreed that when we got back, we'd set up our appointments with the doctors and just see what our options were. However, I remember the plane descending in Milwaukee and tearing up at the thought of having to actually return to reality and the nightmare of infertility. Next slide. We started meeting with the doctors in January of 2008. Uh, we knew that IVF might be our only option, and so we wanted to talk about it up front to make sure we were both comfortable with it. Uh, we agreed from the start that we both believed life started at conception and that we wanted to honor God with any life that we created. Uh, we agreed that it would, we would not create any more embryos than we could use uh, if we did end up doing IVF. Next slide. Now, as a side note, in that same month that we met with the doctors, I had really been thinking a lot about IVF and really praying about what we should do. Um, one night, my husband and I were heading to a winter festival near us. Now, we were in two separate cars, so he was following me, and we got lost on the way. At one point, I flipped on the radio to listen to Telling the Truth, which is a radio sermon broadcast. Now, had I been riding with my husband that day, I would not have had radio control. And had we not gotten lost, the timing here wouldn't have worked out. But as I listened, I heard Pete Briscoe repeat verse after verse about embryos and the sanctity of life. My ears perked up and my heart skipped a beat. I couldn't help but wonder if this was God warning me about IVF. As we pulled into the festival, the sermon wasn't quite over, and so I had pulled over and told my husband that I would meet him inside. As I sat there alone in my car and the sermon came to a close, Fireworks started going off in front of me, over and over. I had goosebumps. I started crying. I knew that God was telling me something big, but I had no idea how big. Next slide. As we met, we met with the doctors, they all had pretty much the same answer for us. Let's do some more testing, and yes, IVF is probably your next step. But we don't recommend limiting the amount of embryos you'll create, as it will cost a lot more money, and it probably won't work. We finally decided on one of the doctors and ran the next batch of tests she wanted us to run. Now, at this point, I really just thought the tests were a formality and that our next meeting with her would be to discuss IVF in further detail. Uh, April 16, 2008 is a day I'll never forget. My husband and I are both CPAs, and we had just finished another grueling tax season. Uh, we were really excited for it to be over and ready to move forward with building our family. Now, as we sat down to discuss the test results with our doctor, I was floored to learn that I had poor egg quality. My FSH test that she had run had come back at over 30. It was supposed to be under 10. I was in shock. She briefly discussed moving forward with donor eggs to do IVF if we wanted to continue with medical treatments. We left really just feeling completely devastated. It just didn't make any sense. I got home that day and quickly referenced the chapter on elevated FSH in my infertility book, and I still remember reading the author's words. If you have elevated FSH, my heart goes out to you, and my heart sank. I quickly scanned our options in the book. Donor eggs were highly encouraged. Donor embryos were very briefly mentioned, as well as traditional adoption. At the time, the donor embryo's eye line caught my eye, but I was so very devastated, I wasn't even ready to start thinking about it that day. The next weeks and months, my husband and I really just grieved the news. We had the test rerun, mostly for my husband, who was in denial. I had read that even if the FSH level comes down, your eggs are probably as bad as your worst test level. The test came back much lower, but we both still knew that IVF was definitely not the road God had planned for us. Part of me was actually relieved. I had really prayed that God would give us a clear sign, and the FSH of over 30 was definitely a clear sign. Our chances of conceiving even with IVF were only about 5%. It just wouldn't be a godly use of our finances to spend that much money with such a little probability that it would work. Next slide. It was at that time I knew I needed to find women that knew exactly what I was going through for support. I found an awesome local support group and to this day, the women that I met there are some of my best friends. Meeting with these ladies helped me really to feel normal again and helped me to grieve. I actually met one of my best friends through our support group, and we were actually able to walk through embryo adoption together. Next slide. In the course of time, Brad and I discussed each option presented to us in a little further detail. Um, egg donation would allow me to be pregnant, but the more we discussed and prayed about it, the less comfortable we felt with it. Brad told me one day that infertility wasn't my issue. We were married, and that made it our issue. We started discussing embryo adoption more and more, and I started getting really excited at the idea of being able to be pregnant. I had dreamt of it for so long, and I loved that this option still gave me that ability. I thought back to the fireworks incident from earlier that year, and part of me knew that this is exactly where God was calling us. I was more excited about embryo adoption from the start than Brad was. Part of that, I think, is just his nature versus mine. I tend to be more impulsive, while he's a little more calculated. Not only that, but we were still grieving the loss of genetic children. But the more we talked about it, the more excited we both got. It 
seemed like such an answer to prayer. I would be able to carry a pregnancy and we would be saving these embryos from their frozen state. He gave me the task of researching different agencies and all the legalities of it while he contemplated it further and continued to grieve. He was a little nervous about the newness of it all, but in the end we really believed it was the perfect fit for our family. We selected snowflakes and we started moving forward. Next slide. We started our paperwork and home study process in July of 2008 and had it completed by October. We had, had to decide on the level of openness we wanted with any prospective donors. Um, this was tough for us to decide, and we went back and forth for a while, but in the end we knew that we needed to leave the door open down the road for any children that would be born to have the option of meeting the donors if they decided to. Embryo adoption probably meant that there would be genetic siblings involved, and we wanted our future children to have the option to connect with them if they so chose. We decided to seek a semi-open relationship with updates via email through Snowflakes. Now the matching phase involved us putting together a profile that we could send to Snowflakes in which they would forward on to prospective donor families and talking with Snowflakes about what we felt would be a good match for us. They sent out our profile to a family in November and by Thanksgiving we were really excited to have our first match. We fell in love from the, with them from the start and I actually pictured my children to look just as the kids in the profile that we received. They were adorable. I felt like I was on our side and I just knew it would work. Next slide. We adopted three embryos and we did our first transfer in March of 2009. They thawed all three embryos to get two that survived the thaw and transferred those two. After an excruciating two week wait, I finally had my labs done and got a call from the nurse. We had a positive beta number. She warned me that it was a little low but said it could just be a late implanter. I decided not to Google anything, but instead to just celebrate that it was positive. For the first time ever, I was pregnant. Sadly, I went back for my second beta a couple days later, only to find out that my HCG had dropped and I was miscarrying. I was devastated. Thankfully, I had this awesome group of ladies in my life that I had met through my support group, and they were really able to comfort me and help me move forward. Next slide. Snowflakes agreed to match us again as soon as we were ready, and in May of 2009, we were matched with another family that had three embryos. Um, we got an email from Megan saying their profile was on, was on its way and she included an email that she received from the donor family. The email was perfect and it spoke right to us. My husband is a huge Badger fan and the last line of the email was a PS saying, please let Brad and Laura know that these embryos have been genetically engineered to be Michigan fans, so they will just have to get over it. <laughs> we knew before we even received the packet that this family was it. We loved their sense of humor and we seemed to hit it off right from the start. Uh, the packet came and we were so excited. It was a perfect match. We signed the contract Mother's Day weekend and by the time all the paperwork was done and the embryos were shipped to our clinic, we did our next transfer on September 5th, 2009. And found out, sorry, on September 15th that we were pregnant, this time with a much higher HCG number. Next slide. I had an awesome pregnancy and 10 days past her due date, McKenna Lee was born. She really, truly is our gift of happiness. Sorry. <laughs> We're so in love, and finally we knew that God had indeed saved this precious little girl just for us. Next slide. Now we had one embryo remaining from that batch of three. We spent a few years just really enjoying our little girl and our new little family. And in the fall of 2012, we decided it was time to transfer the third. Uh, my prayer this time was that God would really just make sure that my body was perfect for transfer and that if this didn't work out, that it wouldn't be through any fault of my body. They started running tests just to make sure everything was good and the doctor found a cyst. Uh, when I went to have it removed, they found endometriosis as well. In December, I had surgery to clean it all out and on January 31st, 2013, we thought and transferred that last little embryo. I was shocked to find out 10 days later that I was pregnant once again. Now, the chances of getting two live babies out of just three embryos is really just not so great, statistically speaking. So often we refer to this one as our bonus baby. We went into this hoping and praying that God would give us one from the set of three, and he blessed us with two. Other than a few scares during pregnancy, pregnancy treated me well once again, and I loved every minute of it. Next slide. Alexander Brooks was born on October 14, 2013. He really is our bonus baby. I always say he's the baby I never knew I needed. He's the sweetest, smiliest, cutest little guy, and McKenna makes such a great big sister. Next slide. 
embryo adoption really and truly did complete our family. Next slide. We have a great relationship with our donor family. It is a semi-open relationship, so we know their first names and where they're from, uh, but not the last names or contact information. Early on, after we had McKenna, they started, they, I think they signed an email, Texas Fan Club, and it really just kind of stuck. I love that they've named themselves that. It's kind of eliminated any searching for terms of what do we call them, or are they the donor family, the genetic family, the biological family. And I love that we could just refer to them as our Texas Fan Club, because it really is truly what they are. Uh, we email periodically. Um, I do make photo books to send to them. Um, occasionally, I think I did it at 3, 6, 9, 12, 18, and then every year for McKenna. And so I've started to do the same things for Alex, just so they can really see how we're doing from a distance. Um, and then I also make an annual slideshow with pictures of the kids and then videos to kind of go along with it so they can see, see the kids. And we really do have a great relationship. Um, they send me updates on how their boys are doing. Um, we got an email earlier this year, actually, that the last line in it, was um, thank you so much for letting us know that we made the best decision to have you both love those two little angels. And it was just really perfect and it was really awesome for us to hear that from them. And I think our kids will really treasure that email someday. Next slide. In closing, for those of you that are considering embryo adoption, um, first I'm going to tell you don't be afraid to seek support. Um, there's local resolve groups, there's online support, there's actually a Facebook, Facebook group um, that's just for embryo adoption, people that are going through it. Um, today, I have play dates with the girls from my support group. Um, as we speak, my best friend is actually babysitting my two embryo adopted kids and her three embryo adopted triplets at my house. <laughs> um, next, educate yourself. Look at all your options before you get into it and really just pray about which one is right for you. In terms of the type of relationship that you want, make sure you really think through it. You know, For us, that actually helped us pick which agency we would choose. Um, what a one agency required an anonymous backup donor, and because we were so set on a semi-open relationship, that kind of steered us in a different direction. Um, and really just put yourself in your kids' shoes down the line. Uh, finally, just really pray about it. Who knows, God might even give you fireworks. And finally, I just wanted to share my blog with you. Um, I do want to warn you that I started this blog after I was pregnant with McKenna, and then backdated some posts, so it's not a blog specifically about infertility and dealing with it and embryo adoption. It's more of kind of my kid's baby book. But there are a lot of random posts sprinkled in there about embryo, why we chose embryo adoption and, and that sort of thing. So um, I appreciate you guys having me, and hopefully towards the end I can answer any questions you guys might have. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Laura. And, and just a second what she said, I, I would certainly encourage you to visit her blog. There are a lot of wonderful posts that are certainly worth the time to take a look at. Um, next up will be uh, the Tim's family, and um, uh, we are very, very happy to have you here today. Thank you all for, for taking the time to be here. Welcome. We are happy to be here. All right. Um, I guess we'll just jump right in. I'm Luke, and uh, my wife Joni is here as well. And um, I just want to say thanks to Laura for being so open and so uh, willing to share. We have a very different story when it comes to embryo adoption, and um, that story differs in that we don't have the same um, struggles of, of pain and disappointment of infertility. We come at this from a uh, very different perspective of having our own biological children and not struggling with infertility at all, but uh, just desiring to be um, a family with adopted children. We've always wanted to adopt, and that kind of stems from our understanding of uh, adopted families in general. They're, they're just cool families, so we wanted that for, for our family and, and how we are adopted by God into his family. That was kind of important. So from that perspective, we began not with embryos or infertility. We, get, we began with adoption um, early in our marriage. So we met uh, at Concordia University at a, <clears throat> in college, um, dated for a long time, off and on. Um, all of the off was my fault. Uh, I'll go ahead and record and say that I screwed that up every time. Um, then got married after college and spent some time not having children just because I was finishing up at the seminary and, and Joni was uh, finishing up college. So we had some, uh, some time of uh, the two of us and then uh, decided to begin our family just as I was 
finishing the seminary and moving on to uh, my first parish. So we, um, first time around, uh, first try really had, uh, got pregnant with our oldest son, Isaac, was about 10 years ago. So um, why don't you take this one? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we, early on, well, before we got married, we had discussed um, both biological children and adopted children just because um, we had known families that had um, adopted children because of infertility, because of other circumstances, and we just thought that that was a great loving relationship. And if we were going to go down a road and um, invest time and money, um, we thought maybe in, we didn't have a whole lot of money. <laughs> so we went ahead and we thought, let's go ahead and, and go down the adoption route if, if we're not able to have our own biological children um, with too much assistance. Um, obviously that wasn't a problem. We got pregnant with Isaac just about right away. Um, however, every time we said, oh, okay, let's, let's maybe have another baby, um, adoption was always brought up and we talked about it and we explored it a little bit, not as, not as um, deep as in depth this time as we, we probably should have. Um, so it, it just didn't happen. Next slide. Um, as far as our journey with the embryo adoption, so we so we have three um, biological children. That our older children are um, 10, 7, and 4. We have Isaac, Matea, and Phoebe. And we um, were just starting to talk about expanding our family one more time. And um, so Luke and I had, you know, talked about, okay, so what are we going to do? Are we going to adopt? Are we going to um, try and have a biological child? And um, somebody came up to Luke and asked for a prayer request um, for a family who had gone through an embryo adoption and they had two little boys in the NICU and um, they weren't doing well. And that sparked an internet search. Um, we looked into embryo adoption, um, what that meant, just the basics. Just We just sort of dove in ourselves. Um, from there, we, we talked to friends that um, had gone through IVF because we found out, you know, what, um, as far as what goes on for the embryo transfer and um, all of that terminology was very new to us. All FSH and beta tests and, and all of that was very new. So we, we did a lot more research with friends that had gone through IVF and we spoke to a doctor, um, our fertility doctor. Then we went ahead and contacted Snowflakes. What do we need to do? What um, what sh where should we start? Is this right for us? That kind of a thing. Next slide. So the uh, when we decided on embryo adoption, um, the timing was just perfect. We had had already begun thinking that we need to expand the family again. Now's the time. Uh, we were thinking about adoption, and um, that prayer request came in literally out of the blue. And my first thought was, I'm happy to pray for that. I don't know what that is. <laughs> so let's go ahead and, and do some research on it. Uh, when we talk about adoption, when Joni and I always talk about adoption, our biggest thing is um, not only do we want to be that kind of a family and experience adoption because we think it's such a huge blessing for everybody involved, uh, we also wanted to be uh, the, the people who could stand in the gap with somebody um, who is in a tough situation, who, you know, was struggling. And, and needed needed somebody to stand in the gap, needed some support. So we always had in our mind that that would be somebody who is struggling to raise a child that they've decided to go ahead and, and have this, you know, complete a pregnancy and all that and, and be there for somebody, be it um, a, a young girl in a tough spot or uh, a couple that just isn't able to afford, whatever. You know, we just wanted to be there for somebody and discover that that's really um, – a big part of, of embryo adoption, people with uh, embryos that they can't use anymore for medical reasons, for all kinds of different reasons. So um, when we discovered that there is a lot of embryos out there that are in, um, that are frozen, that are kind of in a state of limbo because people can't use them or there's legal battles that are out there, there's um, issues of, of divorce and having embryos frozen. There's, 
a million reasons why there's embryos that aren't used. Uh, we thought to ourselves that could be a, a place where we could stand in the gap for uh, a couple who, who are in a tough position. So um, we decided to give embryos a shot and, and see, you know, if, if this is going to work and, and decided to take the next step. And uh, our mentality was let's continue to pursue this until God throws up a roadblock that makes it impossible to happen. And if that's the case, then okay, you know, we, we would be willing to uh, accept God's no, but just never got one. So um, next slide. <laughs> okay, um, everybody wants to know about um, um, the adoption process, especially our family. Um, <clears throat> so we contacted Snowflake and, and found out what we needed to do, and we kind of did the process a little bit backwards. Um, first we did the home study, and then we filled out the other um, Snowflake paperwork, only because the home study was going to take the longest, um, and it did, but it wasn't, it was not grueling, and it wasn't hard if you don't mind paperwork. Um, so there was applications, there was background checks, there was letters of reference, I had to show proof that our dog and dog and cats were vaccinated, I had to have a fire escape plan, I had to have, I mean, things that I normally have, but I just had to pull all that stuff out. You had to go to a shrink to make sure you weren't crazy, which is hard to do when you tell people you want to adopt embryos because that sounds crazy. So. Um, and then, yeah, we did have visits from, from a social worker from Lutheran Family Services of Iowa, and they had worked with snowflakes before, so um, everything went smoothly on that end. So that that's what we did. Um, and then we put, we put together our own family profile um, at, out there for um, the adoptive family to check out. Next slide. Um, our matching process went very quickly. We actually had a quick email um, about an embryo that was kind of a special case. There was just one that didn't um, that that one didn't strike home for us. I think Laura talked about how you know she you just knew when you read you know an email or a profile or whatever. Um, the next profile that came through had four embryos, and the names of, of our um, adoptive, or I mean, our genetic family, and just the profile, um, we read that, and it, we just knew it, it was um, it was an easy decision. It wasn't until later that we discovered that there was pictures, I and mean, we said yes before we even saw pictures. I think weeks later. Yeah. <laughs> um, we prayed a lot about it, and like Luke said, we um, waited for the roadblock, and there wasn't one. <laughs> yeah, it, it, in, in fact, it was so clear and so obvious, it was stunning that this, this was the family, and it was exciting and just a ton of fun to, to see this couple. Um, and they had a, a medical condition that they didn't know about until they started IVF that prevented them from um, – prevented – her from carrying pregnancies full term um, without a, a great deal of medication and intervention. So we felt like that's that was the that was the, the last part. You know, they they believe in the sanctity of life. They uh, believe that life begins at conception. They would not have, have made more embryos than they could use. Um, but had they not gone through IVF, she would have never had the testing. She would have never known uh, and found out that she had this uh, this medical disorder. So there they were, you know, with, with no ill intention or ill will or, or not being irresponsible or anything. They just had extra embryos, and to try and transfer them to have a child would be um, detrimental to her health and very unlikely for a pregnancy to continue. So for us, it was a no-brainer. You know, they didn't want to destroy the embryos, but they couldn't use them. And that's the kind of situation that we were hoping we could be useful for, um, that God would use us in that way. and there it was, perfectly. So it's just a no-brainer. I mean, it was a lot of prayer. And just a note about this, I think Laura kind of said the same thing. It felt like it took forever, um, you know, the, the home study and, and all of that process. There's so much detail and so much to do. But then the matching process, I felt like it went blazingly fast. It, I mean, it went from wait, 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 wait to, okay, four embryos, they're on their way, they're, in, you know, FedEx to your home. <laughs> and it was I mean, just blindingly fast. So that was fun and exciting. Next slide. So then the transfer, they prepared my body uh, for the transfer. 
and they discovered it didn't have a uterus. So, <laughs> um, so um, uh, I didn't know what all went into preparing your body for um, a frozen embryo transfer. There was lots of shots, lots of um, medications, patches, do this, do that. We had a great pharmacist um, that um, they, that our fertility clinic sent us to for all the medications, and she knew exactly what to do, what to take when, how to do it, how to give the shot, um, what foods to eat, what not to eat, that to not be sick, that kind of a thing. Um, and then, um, so then they, they trans on May 9, um, 2013, they transferred, well, we, we found out they thought all four of the embryos and two survived. They transferred two um, embryos um, to me, and about 12 days after, um, I got a phone call, and my um, levels, my HCG levels were about 1,500, which is like triple what it should be. And at seven weeks, we discovered, next slide, Triplets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so as, as Laura said earlier, getting having two live births uh, after, with just three embryos, pretty remarkable. We had three live births with two embryos. Um, the odds of that happening are literally zero. So what we have, uh, obviously two transferred, one split, all three um, implanted, and here we are. Woohoo! Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> So we have so on December 17th, 34 weeks and three days from conception, <laughs> um, transfer. the transfer. Um, I gave birth to Ezekiel, Evangeline, and Malachi. Next slide. I don't know if you can say give birth. I mean, they were more extracted. And, <laughs> and, uh, um, there they are. Um, Malachi's on the left, and Evangeline's in the middle, and Ezekiel's on the right. Um, we are pretty open with our genetic family. I, I guess Laura said that there's semi open because they just kind of do emails. Uh, that's pretty much what we do. We we don't know um, anybody's last name or like their address. But both families are pretty busy. Our genetic family has twin girls and um, they work and so and dogs and cats and and they're busy themselves. So um, we do what we can to stay in touch. Um, but emails seem to be the way to go. And also we. Part of it, too, is that they live like 10,000 miles away, so we're not swinging by anytime soon. Um, but they get also a lot of information, I think, from uh, our website. You'll see that um, link here in a little bit. So we, we do have a lot of pictures um, and, and share a lot of stuff that's just out there in general. So they, they kind of keep tabs with us uh, that way, but there's not really a chance of us swinging by, I don't think, uh, on the Sunday afternoon because we'd have to get on three different planes to get there. So, um, next slide. There we are. Look at us. That's the, if you go around the wheel there, um, Isaac is our oldest in the green there in the bottom left. Um, to his right, moving clockwise, is um, Ezekiel. And then Phoebe is our five year old. She is the youngest of the first three. And then after that is Malachi. And then after that is Matea. And Evangeline there's at the bottom. Matea is 10 years old, by the way. No, she's not. She's seven. Seven. I'm sorry. <laughs> Isaac is 10. Matea is seven. My bad. So uh, just kind of wrapping things up to talk about uh, words of wisdom, advice to couples. Uh, I, will, I will share my personal um, hurdle that I got over. My biggest concern with adoption even, um, outside of embryo adoption, was I was always worried that these kids wouldn't feel entirely like my kids, and I was kind of ashamed of that. Like, it was a, this dirty secret where, like, I, I'd say, oh, yeah, I'm going to treat them like they're my own flesh and blood and, and this and that. But I always kind of worried that deep down, without any, no matter what, I just, I would harbor this thought that, well, yeah, they're not really mine. Um, here's what I can tell you. We have three children the old-fashioned way and three children through embryo adoption, and my feelings for them are identical. I can't tell the difference emotionally. Um, these, these kids are my kids, and it feels weird to think that they're not my flesh and blood. Uh, while Joni was pregnant, I had moments of, 
it was a little weird when a baby would kick in her stomach and I would think to myself, I didn't put that there. That that is odd. <laughs> Definitely speaking, that's that's weird. But then, um, you know, it, it didn't take more than a few minutes of time together in the hospital for me to really truly feel like, yeah, these are my kids. And um, so don't don't worry about that. I, and I think that guys probably especially feel that way that these children aren't going to feel like their kids or they want their own kids. Um, these are my own kids, and there is nothing legally or or emotionally that will tell you anything different. So that's um, my advice. And I would like to kind of add to what Laura said. <clears throat> Do research. Um, talk to people, support groups. Um, that's That was the best thing that we did was um, talk to friends. That if, if they are open enough to, to tell you about their um, – if they tell you that they're going – they've gone through IVF, you know, ask them, what was your experience? Like sometimes they're, if they've got children, they're happy to tell you. Um, we have learned a lot about some of our friends that we didn't know that they struggled with infertility and sometimes that can be a, a very tight bond then. Um, to, just to hear um, what they had to go through and that just really gave us a good perspective on um, just what, what people go through. So, um, but do lots of research. Yeah, and we feel pretty strongly about embryo adoption. There's other options of like embryo donation and other organizations. Um, I talk about that a little bit on the website too, but it, adoption is important. Go through the process, do the home studies. That is so valuable. I, I wouldn't trade that for the world. It would be less expensive to skip some of that stuff, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. It's, it's I think, incredibly important. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that. This is our last slide. This is the our story, graftedgift.com. Um, that's pretty up to date. It's a lot about embryo. It's primarily embryo adoption. Uh, we did a couple of TV spots because not everybody has triplets from embryos who are adopted apparently. Uh, and then there's a, a My Faith Radio a radio spot we've done too. So that's us. And, and in the the question and answer time. Um, I encourage everybody. Joni and I are super open about all kinds of questions. Ask us anything. There is nothing that is off limits. So I guess we're done. Fire away. Excellent. Um, well, thank you very much for sharing that story. And as Luke mentioned, uh, we are into our question and answer session. Um, just as a reminder, uh, you can submit your questions using the Q&A or chat feature on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, just type your questions in, um, and we'll make sure that uh, everyone um, has an opportunity to answer them. I do want to make a quick plug. Uh, we have a webinar coming up next month on Wednesday, uh, July 9th, called How Open is Open Adoption? Um, and this is where we're going to have Chris Probasco and Kelly Poffenberger examine uh, the term open adoption and, and what it really is. There's a lot of misconceptions out there about what an open adoption is or what a semi-open adoption is, and uh, we're going to take a look about that a little bit. Uh, we have had a couple questions come in, uh, so I'll throw this out to both uh, Laura and Luke and Joni. Uh, how did you decide on the level of openness you have with the donor family? And I know you both touched on it a little bit, but maybe go a little more in depth to the process. Sure. I'll, uh, I'll jump in here first. Um, for, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, I, I'm getting I a little bit of a, a little bit of an echo, but I think okay. Is this better now? I took it on your speaker. Yep, you're great. Okay, awesome. Um, so for us, it was really um, we really spent a lot of time trying to figure out what we wanted to do um, in terms of openness, a totally open arrangement. I don't think my husband Brad or I were were comfortable with. We wanted it to be our children, our lives. Didn't really want. I guess we didn't really know what that would look like to have another family kind of hanging out there. Um, and, you know, on the other extreme of closed, closed adoption, we didn't want to do that to our kids. And we kind of put ourselves in their shoes and said, okay, at some point down the road, they're going to have questions. They're going to want to know more information. We're going to want, we would have still gotten medical history from snowflakes, but we want to have that option down the road. If the kids ever did want more information or wanted to meet them or get to know them, we would have have that option. Um, so semi-open kind of worked perfect for us. We wanted enough so that there was more 
option down the road to know more about them, to meet them, whatever, but didn't want to be raising these children with them, I guess is really kind of what it came down to. And uh, when I say we have, you know, we email back and forth, that kind of thing, it's very sporadic. You know, like Luke and Joni had mentioned, you know, we're busy. We both have our own lives, our own families. But kind of the cool thing is, is I think in, even in their profile, they had put, like, we want to be watching you guys from afar to know that everything's okay and we don't want to be in your lives we just want to know that we made the best decision and that kind of thing. And I think the correspondence that we've had with them has all been very positive and they've been very appreciative of the information that we give them because to some extent I didn't really know what to expect. I mean, I remember as soon as McKenna was born wanting to call them up, run to their house, give them a big hug and say, thank you, oh my gosh, you answered every prayer. Look at this this child, what a gift. Um, but at the same time, I had to remember that it was difficult for them because these were their embryos and you know, it's it's just kind of a unique situation, I feel like. The cool thing about um, embryo adoption, I feel like, after infertility, is I feel like the couples that you're going through this with and that are giving up their embry embryos probably know exactly what you're going through. Because more than likely, they've gone through infertility. And so to get matched with someone else who knows what you went through and your struggles and that kind of thing, I think that gift is that much cooler because they know, hey, I, I struggled with this myself and I want to bless someone else. So it's really just been a cool relationship that we have. Um, there have been a lot of emails kind of back and forth just confirming that they know that they've made the right decision. And, you know, obviously we're we're feeling just incredibly blessed to have to have the two kids. So, Luca, Joni, I'll turn it over to you guys. We, uh, we left it very open, although I have to say it's kind of ending up <laughs> semi-open. Um, but we wanted to leave it open enough um, for some contact, you know, possibly meeting someday. But like we said, they, um, our genetic family lives in um, Alaska, so they're not probably going to be showing up at our door anytime soon, um, but or us at their door either. Um, yeah, we that was one of the things that that we felt was too was that, um, well, that I felt like as a mom, you know, this couple had said, okay, here's these embryos, and now, you know, we we are, you know, we have children, and I don't know how I didn't know how um, they would feel, so I, we left it very open, and mostly we're just going by their lead. Um, we left it open so that they could they could contact us, and we are just following what they want. And, and every email that I get back from them, um, we find um, very open and honest. And But like you said, they're, we're, we're all busy. So um, we just mostly left it open because we were just feeling out. Because we didn't come from that road of infertility, we didn't know how hard it would be for that family to contact us or to want to be part of our lives. And I'm also kind of a, I'm a pretty analytical guy. so. Um, the adoption process uh, was good for us too in that they had us go through these webinars and seminars and read books on open adoption and the research just kind of uh, plays out that yeah it's, it's probably good for them to be in an open relationship and then there's this this boogeyman that's out there of you know well what about um, rights what if they want the child back from you that's that's sort of the adoption boogeyman um, you want to be close because you don't want somebody to show up on your door someday and, and want their baby back. But what we discovered is, is uh, with embryo adoption, you have so much more legal, um, we have all of the legal um, rights and there's no other parenting rights. So we have so much more protection over that. It just sort of deflated that whole balloon and it was like, yeah, I don't, I don't care. They can know who we are and, and we can know who they are. If that's what they want, that's fine. So that's, that's kind of how I came at it. Excellent. Um, Luke and Joni, we had a question come in for you. Uh, what was the most valuable aspect of going through an adoption process for you? That's hard because um, I found it very valuable. So what do you think, Joni? What's the, the most valuable part? Um, going through the adoption process. Well, you know, I did talk about how, you know, we filled out paperwork and this and that and the, all those things that we had in order and when we just had a baby, it was already there. Nobody nobody checked to make sure that we had, you know, a fire escape plan or that we had auto insurance or homeowner's insurance and, and all that kind of stuff. You know, I don't, it just felt like we were... Um, 
really investing and not just going to a fertility clinic and having a baby or having a, an embryo donated to us. We were we were investing our our time and our effort and just kind of it, it solidified that we we were working hard that we wanted this. Um, it also helped, like like we said, that we were just waiting for that roadblock and it never hit and we never got there. So that was helpful that we had to go through hoops of the adoption process. Plus, we knew that the people, you know. Um, giving up their, their embryos, that this was a loving and um, thoughtful process for them, too. Go, putting together your, your um, bio and, and your family profile is so, um, you know, it's just you're looking at yourself and your own family, and that was, that was helpful. Um, it was helpful for, for just our, um, our family that we already had created, and it was helpful for us to keep growing them. It, it really, it's, it's hard for me to articulate because it's so, it was so valuable. Um, I, I kind of speak passionately about that. We've been asked to speak about uh, with other organizations on embryo donation and I've turned it down because I don't, I don't support it. I don't like embryo donation. Um, it is harder. There's more stuff and it's more expensive to go the adoption route with the donation. But these are human beings. These are lives. These are children. It shouldn't be quick and easy. You should do things. It should take time, and you should slow down and think, and, and it forces you to consider things instead of, as Joni said, you know, just going to a fertility clinic and saying, I'd like four, please, um, and and having no information, no background, and doing no work. It just doesn't, didn't seem right. And it was just really valuable because um, it helps us really understand the, the value and the energy and the effort put into to creating these embryos and how important they are. So I I struggled to even say one thing, but it's incredibly important, I think, to go through the adoption process. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Laura, we had a question come in specifically for you uh, regarding the rematching process. I know you had to be uh, rematched with another donor family. Uh, would yeah. you talk a little bit about what that process was like? Sure. Um, for us with snowflakes, the thing we liked about snowflakes, and I and I, I think some of this has changed since then, but initially when we signed up with snowflakes, you paid a certain fee, and for that fee, um, you got matched with up to three families or until a live birth. So for us, the nice thing about that was when the first match resulted in miscarriage, we didn't have to go back to the drawing board and say, okay, are we going to do this again? Are we not going to do this again? It was one of those where as soon as we were ready, all we did is we contacted Snowflakes and said, you know what, we're ready for number two. Like, let's match this with another family. Let's just kind of get the ball rolling again. And I'm going to be honest with you, the very next match we got, and I didn't say that in my – didn't have time to include that in my, my story, but the next match we got, we didn't feel a connection. And I was heartbroken. I got the match, and I remember feeling guilty. Like, how can I leave these embryos behind? Like, how can I say no to life? And I remember calling Megan, who worked at Snowflakes at the time, and she said, you know what, Laura? She said, if you feel that way, don't take them. Like, those are someone else's kids. Those aren't the kids that God has for you. And so we had rejected that match, sent back the information, and then she forwarded us the next match, which happened to be the Texas Fan Club. Um, so the process was actually, it, it worked out very well. The next match, you know, obviously we got it and we loved it, and we decided, yeah, let's move forward, and, you know, the rest is kind of history. But the rematching process was really, really pretty smooth. Um, like I said, the hardest part was getting a match that we, we we didn't fall in love with, and, you know, I think they handled that, that great and it really made it an easy process for us. All right. Um, I've seen one other question come in. Uh, so... Um, I'll ask that, and if you out there uh, have any questions that you would like to slide in under the radar, uh, please submit them now. Um, so I'll, I'll ask this to both of you and maybe start with Luke and Joni. Um, do your children know about their genetic origins, which they might be a little young to yet? Um, <laughs> have you shared this with them, or do you plan to? Um, and also, what advice, if any, would you give to adoptive families who are considering not sharing the child's genetic origins with them? Um, well, our um, babies are just shy of six months, so um, they don't know their genetic origins. But our um, our older three children do know um, that um, 
as much as they can know and understand embryos at, at whatever age level they're at, CD5, <clears throat> and to her, we tried to explain to her that they're babies, but they don't have a bot. I mean, it's really hard. It was hard to explain embryos to her. Um, but the other two got it, and they understood that um, we tried to just very much, uh, there's books out there about what is embryo adoption, um, how embryos are created, um, adoption in general for, for um, kids. Um, so the, so our, our older kids know, and we do plan on sharing that with um, the triplets. Um, and let's see. Uh, I, I guess what we have, our research into um, sharing or not sharing genetic origins has really always been to share the genetic origin with the children, so I don't think we would ever keep that from them. Um, because I think once you are building up such a strong um, foundation within your own family, I don't think it really matters where you came from um, to us. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come at this. Um, from like two different sides. The first one is, um, well, I think there's there's two reasons why people wonder, ask the question, or, or hesitate sharing that information. The first one is that the parents um, are afraid. They, they have some sense of um, fear, and then they're worried that they need to protect their kids as well as uh, as if they're worried that their kids are going to feel um, slighted or second best um, or different or something like that. And the first Firsthand, there's no reason to feel threatened as parents because you are raising children that aren't genetically connected to you. There's there's no threat whatsoever. Sharing that information doesn't change anything because um, that which is genetic, that which is biological, isn't that which binds us together. Um, you love your kids not for their biology. You love your kids because they are um, part of your family. Uh, and and so it, th that that kind of dispels itself eventually. You, you figure that out pretty quick. The the second one is more powerful, and that is the desire to want to shield and protect your kids from something. And it's a myth. You're not shielding them or protecting them from something because there's there's nothing out there to shield and protect them from. Um, they're not second rate. They're not second class. I have three kids who were given to me as a gift from God. And I have three kids that are a gift from God that I had to pursue. And they're different. I mean, the one given and received, the, the, the children that are born in the natural old-fashioned way in our family, we love and rejoice that they are given to us as a gift. But it's not less powerful for the other three, for the triplets, to know that we pursued this and we went after it. And we had to work harder. Uh, we had to be more diligent, focused, and, and we went after this thing. That doesn't make them less special. Um, I mean, you, you can make a case that makes them more special. So I'm, I'm not worried about them feeling badly someday because they're adopted and genetically they're different. I'm, I anticipate them feeling more special because they're the, the gifts that we had to pursue. And, Laura, I'll ask you the same question. Yeah, I mean, uh, Luke, you touched on it at the end there. You know, you, you talk about these kids being more special because God chose them just for you. I mean, I look at, you know, McKenna, and, uh, I mean, I think it's awesome that God froze her. And it, just as a kind of a side note, she, you know, looking back through my fertility records and our testing and all that, when I had talked about when we went into our OB the first time and said, let's do a workup of tests. I know it's early, but let's do a workup of tests. When our OB did our testing on that day, she ran the FSH test, and she ran it on the wrong day. It's supposed to be run on day three. She ran it on day 25. So the results, I didn't know at the time it was supposed to be run on day three. But looking back, she ran it on the wrong day. Well, if you line up the calendars to when McKenna and Alex's embryos were created, they were created that exact same month. And I just look at God's plan for us and God's plan for our family, and I look at, you know, had that OB run that test on the right day, I'd be in a completely different boat right now. You know, the genetic family wouldn't have been ready to 
you don't necessarily give these embryos up for adoption and kind of that kind of thing. So I, I look at things like that and, I, and that kind of feeds into our story. And I think that, you know, God did save these embryos just for us. And they're, if anything, they're, they're more special because they had to go through so much to get into our family. Um, in terms of her genetics and sharing that with her, I mean, she's four. So to the extent she gets it, she knows it. Um, what I have done, we've always had the conversation with her that she was a frozen baby. And actually, if you show her pictures of embryos, she will tell you those are frozen babies. Um, while Alex was still frozen, we would pray for a frozen baby all the time. And so she knows to the extent she can, you know, what a frozen embryo is. Um, and I did put a book together for her that talks about, you know, mommy and daddy really wanted a baby. We were really sad. You know, we prayed to God. God found this family in Texas that had extra frozen babies that they wanted to really share with another family that was sad. And so they shared them with us and, you know, kind of walked through my pregnancy and then, and then her. So we've read that story to her. Um, the first time we read it, it was one of those like, oh, okay, she's going to love this. And it was, I want to read a princess book. You know, so it's you, you kind of pick up on their cues and that kind of thing. Um, but we always are very upfront with letting her know. Um, the, the cool thing this year is with the Frozen movie that's out, she thinks it's the coolest thing in the world that she was a Frozen baby um, and that she was once frozen. And I told her that once and it was like, oh, my gosh, I was once frozen. Um, so it's just been kind of neat. Um, in terms of advice I would give um, to adoptive families that are planning on not sharing the genetic origins with them, I mean, same thing that Luke and Joni had said. If it's a secret that you're keeping, it, it almost has a kind of that it's that it's shameful and that you're not proud of it and that it's a bad thing and I don't think that that's it at all you know I just look at you know if my parents would have sat me down when I was 15 and said I was adopted I mean it, it's one of those things that why are you hiding that from me if it's not a big deal why are you hiding it and as we always said I mean in terms of genetics it was funny because when we were grieving the loss of a genetic child and going through you know just that that loss my husband always says you know I sat down at Thanksgiving that year looked around the table and thought Seriously, like I'm worried about genetics. My, my family's all crazy, and I, and I think a lot of people can joke about that. Um, but in all honesty, like genetics just don't matter. Um, they just don't matter to us. And so, really, just to kind of downplay that, um, and, and and really just share share the story. And and I think it, God kind of takes it from there. And like I said, I, I just love even embryo adopted, regular adopted, you know, whatever adoption that you've been through. I, I just think it's, it's such a great picture of God adopting us into his family and kind of that same thing. And I think that's what we try to equate it to for McKenna at this point is, you know, God adopted us into him, his family the same way we adopted you into our family. I love what you said about the, the movie Frozen. I think that's a great <laughs> It's very cute. Um, we've had one final question come in, and this will be our last question of the day. Um, and I'll, I'll throw it to you, Laura, first, and then Luke and Joni. Sure. Uh, how have your friends and extended extended family reacted to your decision to adopt embryos? Um, for us, it's all been very positive. I actually remember the first time sitting my parents down and letting them know what we were going to do. My grandma, who's 95 now, she must have been around 90 at the time, was sitting in on the conversation, and it was one of those where – she didn't fully understand it. She didn't fully grasp it. Um, but now that she knows more about it and, you know, the whole understanding IVF and that kind of thing, it's just, she's just amazed. And we really get a lot of positive feedback, a lot of, wow, I didn't even know that existed. And what I try to do, you know, through Facebook, through our blog, through things like this, is really just educate other people um, and just really let them know that it's out there. Because I never knew it existed until I needed it. And, you know, I've got friends, there's people in my support group that have are on the other side and they have extra embryos remaining. And so I really try to be pretty transparent and pretty open about what we've done. Um, I try to share our story, pictures of the kids, you know, our relationship with the donor family, that kind of thing, all in a very positive light and just share the awesome things that God has done. Number one, just to really give God the glory for that. And number two, really just to let other people know that this is out there and you know, maybe they don't know about it. Maybe they have friends going through this. You know, who knows? But really just try to be really open. And we've had, you know, really awesome feedback. I have been fortunate enough not to have anyone, I don't think, that has told me that was weird. I mean, people certainly, I'm sure, are out there that say it's weird. But I haven't really had any issues with anyone um, really having a problem with it or making me feel awkward or things like that. It's all been 100% positive and just really encouraging. And Luke and Joni, I'll, I'll ask you the same thing. We haven't had anybody really uh, um, 
like Laura said, we really kind of just want to let people know it's out there. A lot of people we talk to, they're like, wow, I didn't know that was an option. Um, either because they have embryos or they know somebody that has embryos and they're really hurting and, and want to know what to do. And um, so, I mean, our, our family thought it was a little strange, <laughs> but it is. It's <laughs> unique, isn't it? Yeah. It's unique. And, and what they were... They were all for it. My mother-in-law had to give me shots when Luke was on a mission trip. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, they they participated fully. So, um, and you know, once the once the babies are here, uh, that all kind of like drifts away. And yeah, they know where they came from. But um, once once a child is there, it doesn't matter how they got there. Yeah. It, it, and in our church family and our friends and our and our family family it's nobody cares anymore they're just so happy that there's babies here it really seems silly to to even think that um it would be an issue but we know we're very public and open we've been all over the place in the news and in the church and all of that so we've bumped into a couple of people and, and all i can say over and over again is educate 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 it's not that no nobody has really ever um, thought that this was a bad thing or, or given us any negative feedback once they understand it. I did have, um, kind of reminds me of what Laura said about her grandmother. I had a, a lady really upset with me um, in our church because uh, she couldn't believe that I was going to allow Joni to have sex with another man. And I said, whoa, that is not embryo adoption. <laughs> um, and so once she understood, what it, it, it turned from really upset with me to, oh my gosh, I love that in, in you know, three sentences. So um, just if you just keep educating, educating and telling people, um, mm -hmm. it's just a non-issue entirely, I think. It, we've had nothing but love and support, so. <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Luke and Joni and Laura uh, for taking time out of your busy schedules and working for the past couple weeks to help make this presentation possible. Um, we loved hearing your stories and are, are greatly appreciative. Uh, we are ready to end our webinar for today. Thank you for our attendees uh, for coming, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at future Awareness Center events. Have a great day, everyone.